So I want to take this opportunity to introduce Laura Gomez Rodriguez. Laura is a highly respected journalist and investigative reporter. She graduated from Emerson College in Boston, Massachusetts in 2014. She's worked for the Arizona Republic at Low Laws, Arizona, covering city government, economic development, immigration, politics, and trade. In 2017, Laura traveled the length Notice I put the length of the U.S.-Mexico border for a production called The Wall, which later received a Pulitzer Prize Award. She is currently working with the Arizona Mirror and was named Best Investigative Reporter by Phoenix Magazine. Today, she is speaking on the topic of who pays the price for righting wrongs. Please join me in welcoming Laura Gomez. Nobody has ever really 
We don't know what he looks like. Nobody has taken his photo. Nobody has interviewed him. Um, nobody has really heard from him other than knowing his name because um, he filed his lawsuit back in 2007. So I was really skeptical. I was like, you know, this is probably somebody just pretending um, to be Melendre. So I don't know, they could um, talk to me about the coverage that I had been doing at the time, which was related to some uh, monetary compensation that certain people impacted by um, a portion of the lawsuit could access. So I called my friend, uh, Nick Oza, who is an amazing photojournalist here in Arizona. And I told him, hey, I got this text message. I have no idea who this person is who he says he is. What do you think I should do? Are you, would you be down to come with me? Because um, I didn't want to go alone and meet this person for an interview. It sounds like he wants to talk. And he said, yeah, I'm in Mexico right now um, covering border issues. But um, when I get back on Monday, I'll, I'll be happy to find a time where we can go meet this person who's asking me. So I called the number, and you know, this guy said he was Manuel. But he didn't really want to talk on the phone, he wanted to meet. Um, and, you know, I think at that moment, I thought, okay, if this person isn't who he says he is, it's probably just a waste of my time. If this person is who he says he is, this is a really big deal. This is October, yeah, October of, uh, no, not October, August of 2016. Um, so, you know, the presidential election is, you know, you know, we're very into that electoral cycle. Um, Joe Arpaio is running for the re-election once again, um, and he eventually lost that election, which was a historic win um, here in Arizona. Um, but, you know, when I talked to Manuel, he told me, you know, I can really meet with you, I'm going back to Mexico. So then I kind of waited it out, and when he came back, we ended up meeting. And um, I remember we first met at a restaurant uh, that he picked. And, um, you know, by then I already understood that, that this was a really important story, that this was a, a, a man who had been wronged by, um, by our law enforcement who had been arrested without really any reason um, and was traumatized because of this. Just to tell you a little bit about the background of him, um, which I learned as I started interviewing him. He was a public school teacher in Sonora, which is you know, the state just south of us in Mexico. Uh, he, that was, you know, what he did his whole career, and he had retired from, you know, a career in public schools, and he really prided himself in sort of being like a role model. Um, he was very respectful, shows his words very carefully, and the moment when we were speaking, and I think when we first met, it was already October, 2016, it had been <coughs> nine years, more than nine years, since he was first arrested by MCSO deputies, taken into custody, driven to the ICE headquarters in Phoenix, where he eventually was let go because he was here on a tourist visa. He, um, there was, you know, no, no real immigration violation that he had committed. And at the time, um, if you know a little bit about what happened here in Arizona through your lived experiences or you're just learning about the state that you know you live in now, um, Joe Arpaio was really openly saying that he wanted to arrest people to check their immigration status to then get them deported. And in the process, he would stop US citizens, he would stop uh, people from indigenous communities. Um, he was just really going after them. And this is what 
uh, that they shall go for the lawsuit that Manuel filed in 2007, eventually found in 2013, after the whole sort of court process went through. So when I first met with Manuel, um, it was really, he, I could really tell that he didn't want to talk about anything more than that incident. He was really embarrassed, you know, at this time, you know, I think he's probably in his 60s. I was in my early 20s when I was talking to him. And this was so embarrassing for him to share. I could tell because he would tell me, like, you know, I am so ashamed to share this with you, but it's important. And he told me how um, the day when he was stopped, yeah, an MCSO deputy was, you know, patting him down. And he found a little bottle of hemp um, moisturizer cream that he used to moisturize his hand. And the deputy took that little bottle, looked at him, and told him is that what he used to masturbate. And he was so embarrassed to tell me that. But he wanted to share that moment with me because it really showed how dehumanizing and how much cruelty and violence, really, he experienced um, just because of the color of his skin. And uh, the more I talked to him, the more um, he would sort of trust me. This was, again, like in 2016. I know a lot of my colleagues wanted me to get this story out really quickly to have it out before the election in case, you know, it, it you know, it was very relevant to the election, of course. But I wanted to wait because I knew that Manuel, it had taken Manuel almost 10 years to get to this point where he felt comfortable opening up about what happened that day. I eventually spoke to his wife who told me that she remembers Manuel being this, you know, sort of like the rock of their family a man who would, you know, play the guitar in some afternoons and sing her romantic songs. And after that arrest, he became really insecure, really nervous to leave his house. He lost his hair, he couldn't sleep because he was so scared that because he had filed this lawsuit against one of the most prominent and powerful persons not just in Maricopa County, but around the country, that he was going to be retaliated against. He told me how he had an injury from boxing on his, I think it was his right wrist, and when he was handcuffed, the deputies, you know, sort of tied his hands so tightly that they re-injured him, and he had a deformity on his left his right wrist um, because of that. You know, I eventually, after I think meeting with him three or four times and talking many times over the phone about this story, the story was published in the Arizona Republic in December of 2016. But, you know, I still, I, I think about, you know, Manuel's story and his strength and really what it takes to, to achieve justice. I think maybe as journalists and as you know, members of the community, we celebrate uh, justice seekers. We, um, we welcome them, we cheer them on, but we don't really uh, sort of think about, are we, take, are we actually taking care of them? You know, speaking to a journalist requires that you know, you're gonna be sharing something very personal about your life, you're gonna be opening up. And you have no control over what that reporter is gonna write about you, about your wounds, about your pains, about things that are very personal to you. You know, I think about that when we talk about Darnella Fraser, the 17-year-old who reported the murder of George Floyd last year. Um, 
She was a laureate with, you know, an honorary Pulitzer Prize, which is the highest honor in journalism. Um, and we recognize that. Um, but she still had to watch some of that. And how are we, how are we as journalists, how are we as a community taking care of the people that we celebrate for stepping into a press conference, for you know, coming out to a rally to protest for social justice, for filing a lawsuit. Um, those are the things that I sort of wanted to bring here um, as reflections, things to reflect on. Um, you know, just how we, the people who pay the toll for this trauma um, that it takes to seek justice. Those were mainly, that was mainly that the story that I wanted to share with you, and if you have any questions, um, I'd love to hear what you think. Yes. Hi, so I have one question from the end of your story, basically. What do you think is important for aspiring young people, young girls, or just young journalists in general, um, to keep in mind when reporting on high communities or injustice? So your question is, uh, what should aspiring Latinx youth or uh, people who want to be journalists keep in mind when reporting on white power? Communities that experience injustice? Um, well, I'll, I mean, I'll just share something that I, um, I think maybe, I hope journalism schools don't do this now, but they often tell you that, you know, we have to be removed from the people we cover as if we don't feel, as if we don't care. Um, and I reject that, honestly. I think we have to treat people with humanity. I honestly don't, you know, I think, for example, there's a lot of conversations about, you know, we don't pay people for their interviews. We don't pay people for um, talking to us. That's unethical. But I don't think we talk about the ethics of me injuring people who open up their trauma to us. We don't take care of them. And, um, you know, and I don't think that's something that's defined in journalism, in the journalism industry. Um, and I just, that's sort of something that's still, you know, in my mind, and I don't really have like, anything super definitive to share other than don't, don't distance distance yourself from your own um, humanity, your own experiences, like the things that you feel is what makes you human and what connects with all. I know it sounds like spiritual. that 
at that event, he was going to pardon our prior. And I remember covering the protest around that. Um, they were huge. People were really angry that this would happen because it took a lot um, for there to be accountability. Um, and as a result of that pro protest, there have been several lawsuits that people have filed claiming that Phoenix police use excessive force uh, to retaliate against people um, expressing their First Amendment rights, which is still relevant, like we saw that last year. Um, so, you know, I think there's obviously a continuation of that discontent that was felt by communities um, that's still super relevant today. One of the questions is, Sheriff's departments are notorious for seeking retribution. Did you ever fear for your life when covering this story? Um, no, I didn't fear for my life. Um, I know specifically Sheriff Arpaio was infamous for retaliating against uh, political opponents. Um, I I don't know what he, um, I know there were some instances where he, I don't remember the details, but he would talk to 
about journalists in a certain way, or, or you know, I know I spoke to some people who were veteran journalists here in Arizona, and they, they would say, like, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm being followed, but nothing complete. I never feared for my life um, or was scared um, of covering the story. Um, I think Jared Pari actually welcomes the press and has this really cozy relationship with the media, even though um, he enjoys that access. And he, I think he still does. So that was something I was concerned about. Um, what is an aspect of immigration in Arizona or TP that you believe needs adjustments to improve? Um, I mean, I can share with you some of the things that I've heard. Um, obviously, I'm sure you've all heard about tens of thousands of um, people who were evacuated from Afghanistan. Um, they're gonna, some of them are going to be resettled here in Arizona, um, Phoenix area. I don't think specifically in Tempe, but I know some immigration groups are asking people to you know, make welcoming statements um, for refugees. Uh, one story that maybe was related to Tempe and immigration that I covered um, was about a woman who was standing in the light rail tracks area or like the light rail station area and she didn't have a ticket, um, which apparently is against the Valley Metro Code of Conduct rules. You have to have a ticket to just stand there. Um, so she was approached by um, one of the Valley Metro uh, police um, officers. She was asked for ID, then they ran her ID. They found that she had a warrant for her arrest. They arrested her. She was an undocumented immigrant. She was put in a detention center, and that's how I sort of found out about her story. Um, so that's something else that sort of, I cover immigration and I always say that like immigration touches so many aspects of our society without us really thinking. It's not just about the border. Um, it's about housing, it's about public transportation clearly, it's about um, education. Um, so that's, Maybe something that just comes to mind in terms of like anything in Tempe related to immigration um, that has resulted in, in someone's uh, arrest. Um, let's see. What are your thoughts on the Senate parliamentarian ruling that immigration reform should not be put in the spending bill? I'm honestly not an expert on this. Um, I've heard uh, that there are ways to keep pushing for that, and we'll see what continues to happen, and if some immigration reform is actually achieved this year, it could be, like, I think, the first time in almost 30 years. Uh, does anybody else have a question or thoughts? Yeah. Um, I just, I just posted this, but I'll just read it to you. Um, you talked about um, wanting to um, go against what institutions teach about like um, being emotionally distant, um, but then also having like a not to say fair, but like an impartial media source. Do you think that you can do both and embrace the story emotionally, but still remain objectively factual? Yeah. So I think um, what I said also goes in line with what I. Uh, how I feel journalism schools and the journalism industry needs to evolve, evolve away from the notion of objectivity. Mm -hmm. um, because, I, I mean, I don't think you can honestly say that something is objective. Right. Um, so what we can do instead is uh, be accurate mm -hmm. and be fair. Um, I think those are much more achievable right. and like uh, tangible things.
things that we can do. Um, objectivity is, um, you know, I think that notion came around by recognizing that journalists can be ob objective, so then we have systems and processes to make sure that, that we get as close as possible to it, which means, you know, having different sources, verifying information. Um, so I think accuracy and fairness are much better ideals to sort of uh, live by or work with as a journalist. And that should not require you to stop feeling um, whatever comes up. I think that the question is, which I've experienced this last year, it's like, how do you sort of leave work at work and not let that get into other aspects of your lives? And that's a boundary that I'm still building um, professionally. So. But it's worth it to, to ask and keep working on it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, there's a reporter at Joe Ohio. I don't know, but the taxpayer there is paying over $100 million for the crimes he committed. It's illegal arrest and et cetera. And come, what a So, how hard is it for you to get you know, into his or Things that you don't want to see, and kind of 
clearly not true in this information. I can tell you the measure. And what I always tell them, especially because Colombia is going to have a presidential election next year, is that um, you know just as you're careful when you're picking the food that you're going to eat or the food that you're going to buy your family, you know, you pick up. I don't know. Well, nobody looks at the nutritional facts of a water bottle, but <laughs> where we kind of want to see what's in it, so you know what you're consuming. I think we shall approach consuming information in the same way. So I tell them, you know, find a journalist or a publication that you trust, that you've investigated that you've done your own research on, and stick with them, and question the things that you receive. It's very easy to confirm something. It's very easy to know if something is fake. It's not that hard, I think. I mean, we're all, we all have access, well, most of us have access to computer and Google, and you can pretty easily find if something is not true. Um, so that's what I tell people. You know, it's like, okay, um, you know, maybe I didn't earn your trust, or maybe my organization didn't earn your trust, but I hope that, you know, you do your own research um, and are a more conscious news consumer, information consumer. Anybody else? Yes? Um, in what ways does caring differently about the people you're writing about? raise questions about the economics of journalism. In what ways does caring about the people I write about raise questions about the economics of journalism? Yeah, so just as an example, you, you mentioned in your story that there was some pressure on you to publish a story quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly given the timing of the story, yeah. it could have led to more website hits, for the, you know, for the website, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And all of that is monetized. Yes. Yeah. You took longer, right? That cost the newspaper more, right? Your labor, right? And it also perhaps affected the readership of the piece. And so I'm just curious to know, like, what, how your approach questions the economic models that support what you yeah, I think, um, I've never thought about that, to be honest, but um, I think there are some, there is this, I, I guess I would call it maybe like an ideal in journalism that, you know, um, whoever gets it up first is, is more, most benefited by it, um, which I disagree with too. I think it's more important to get it right which was the case in Manuel's case, I could have sat down with him one time, written a story from his perspective and published that. Um, but the story which was more accurate and more fair when I took my time to talk to him. I frankly do not think about the, how my approach impacts or not the economics of the publications I work for. Um, or what questions are they raising to you? You know, I mean, I think there's, I think just this, um, it's almost like the work ethic of like breaking news, right? Like, we broke the news about this, or we got a scoop, or things like that. And, and I think that's almost sort of um, presented as, as an ideal of what big journalists do, or what excelling reporters, or who SL reporters are. Um, and I, I personally don't, don't work that way. Um, but I think it's also balanced. I know like my editor does appreciate those things, like if you're the first to a story. So I think in a, in a way it's good to have him to just put a little bit of pressure on me to get things done quick, quicker without, you know, uh, sort of 
not at the cost of my um, ethics as well. Yes. Yeah.
I would have, I would have never seen Boston through that lens if I, if I wasn't a journalist. And I think that's true here too in Arizona. Like, I, I don't know what version of Phoenix I would see or of Arizona I would see if I wasn't a journalist. So I think that was my favorite thing. Why did you choose, sorry, I like forgot my question for a second, but why did you choose to tell us about this story? Um, yeah, I mean, I still talk to him online. I, I, I stay in touch with him. Um, and, and his story, and, and when I interviewed him and spent time with him, like, that was sort of like the story that kind of shown me in a very like, clear way why it's the price that people pay for their, and the toll that it takes to see justice like he did. Like, he did it, he filed this lawsuit because of his ideals, because he believes that he was wrong, because he believes that that what they did to him isn't right. And he stood by that. And you know, despite being scared that he would be retaliated, that he would be arrested and taken away from his family, he did it. And I think so many people in our society every day experience injustice, every day experience, you know, violence, every day experience things that are a violation of their rights. But they don't speak up, but they don't do anything about it because it's a lot. Like, and I think, you know, I think we sort of, I guess as journalists, we rely a lot on people, you know, blowing the whistle or coming to us uh, to tell us about these things. But that's a really, really, that's a lot to ask, honestly, um, of people. And when it happens, it's a privilege, and it should be recognized and celebrated, and not taken for granted. But really, that story that I did, that I worked on with my life, it was like, wow, like, I'm, you know, I think everybody should be super grateful for what he did, because it led to make very important changes. Um, but the toll was really, really high. Um, yeah. As like you know, community or even as a journalist, what can we do to help those uh, justice figures like open up about their trauma and what they went through? Like, what can we do to support them? What do you think can be done? Whether that is, you know, 
not including your name in the story, which we do very rarely, but we do that out of a concern of people's safety. Um, but I think there's more that we should be doing, to be honest, more than those things that we have already done. I think I would like to see sort of a more intentional investment of resources in providing um, people who we are asking to relive their trauma um, for our, you know, for our goal of uh, sharing their story and bringing more attention to them. Um, but that's something, like I said, I still think about, I don't know where it lands. And I hope, uh, yeah. Yeah, it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, when you're writing a piece or, uh, you know, just going over something, how do you recognize and address like your own personal bias of the subject? And how do you, like, when you do address it, what do you, uh, what do you do to, like, Yeah, I mean, I think we have sort of, um, I guess you would call them systems to make sure that, let's say we're doing everything the same. Um, like when I go out and interview a person, you know, I always ask for their name, last name, age, city they live in, occupation. Um, I'll tell you an example of a bias that I recognized uh, when I was writing, I don't, honestly, I don't remember what it was, I just remember it very clearly, but, um, I, yeah, I think it was, I was covering a protest or a rally, um, and like I said, like, we often ask people for their name, for their last name, for the age, the city they live in, and I noticed that, um, when I went back to the office and started to write out my notes and stuff, I wasn't asking the woman I was interviewing for their occupation. Um, and I was like, you know, why am I doing that? I, you know, I mean, I'm a woman. I come from a very strong line of uh, women who are independent in the work and, um, you know, sort of lifted their families by themselves. And so I don't consider myself to be, you know, have biases against women. Um, but in doing that, um, sort of like noticing this thing in, in the notes that I was transcribing, I noticed that, you know, for some reason, I probably made assumptions about, you know, that they just had the time or were at home. That's why they were at a rally or a protest. Um, so that's an example of like when I did that, I think. That's why it's also important to uh, be really receptive to feedback. I think journalists we sometimes can be very like, maybe thinking that everybody's out to get us and we don't, and we don't take in criticism very well. Um, but I think it's important to listen to maybe the blind spots that people point out um, and not be defensive or dismissive of those things. Um, but that one might cut. Yes. Um, I think you can be an activist for certain things and be a journalist at the same time. Um, you know, I think there are journalists that are <coughs> activists for better representation in the media. Um, I think there are journalists that are activists for, you know, having more black journalists um, in our industry or lifting up um, reporters of color. Um, so I think, you know, I think there are things that can coexist, but is there a specific case?
Yeah, there are a lot of policies restricting, you know, like I know, I don't, I'm not certain at my current workplace, to be honest, but I know before, you know, we couldn't go to any march, like nothing. Um, because it would seem like, you know, you're associating yourself with like certain political um, groups. Um, I don't know, I think there are some things that are very basic that we can all agree should be part of our society and an ideal. I think, like, you know, going back to the question about objectivity, like, journalists make statements of ideals all the time and say the public has the right to know. That's not, you know, that's not a law, that's not protected by, by anything, but that's an ideal that we have to say, you know, we do this because the public has the right to know. Um, so I think similarly to that, we can also have um, other things that we all agree fit within our values of as journalists um, that maybe 10 years ago we would have considered to be Okay, yeah. We've got seven minutes over time. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause.